We're in our series, Transformed, kind of out of order. Uh, we're, we took chapter 26 last week, and we're jumping back to chapter 25. So if you have a Bible you want to follow along on the screen, that's cool too. Acts chapter 25, verse 6 says, After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took a seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. What's going on here is we see Paul standing in front of another group of people having to tell a story and defend himself again and again. That's the theme that we see, and here he is again. When he'd arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against them that they could not prove. This is what I call Groundhog Day for Paul. How many of you guys have seen that movie, Groundhog Day? The same day, over and over and over again. And so let's rewind the tape, and we're going to kind of do some review of where we've been. Go back it up all the way to chapter 21. Chapter 21 is where it kind of starts, and Paul is falsely accused by people of starting a riot that he didn't do. He's carried away by the soldiers trying to protect him. And he says, hey, wait a minute, let me have a word with these people. He stands up and he starts to tell his testimony, his story about how he used to be and about how he now is. And chapter 22 is where he shares his testimony and, uh, the, and how he was changed. You know, really we, what we see here is Paul had a hard heart. He didn't know it. And that's what we talked about. If you missed that message of mine where I talked, shared my story about having a hard heart, you need to go back and listen to it. A lot of people are getting changed by that message, and you can have a hard heart and not even know it. And uh, Paul says, I'm new. I've changed. I, like, God has done something new on the inside of me. Do you realize that people will resist a new you because there are some people who benefited from the old you? And there are people who benefited from the old Paul, and so they resisted that. Listen, anytime you want to change or grow in God, people are going to resist it because people like you where you are for a variety of reasons. And one of the things that we looked at in that message is that, that a lot of times we say we want to grow and a lot of us have matured in God, but many times it's, it's not because, it, I put it this way, that life transitions have replaced kingdom transformations as a means and measurement for spiritual growth, meaning that when we're walking with Jesus, many of us have matured over the years, but it's many times because of life transitions. Like I was a child and now I became a teenager, so because of that transition in life, I had to grow, but I was walking with Jesus, so I grew some. And the teenager become a young adult, you grow. Young adult, you get married. How many of you guys know marriage, you gotta change some things a little bit. You know, some of us don't do it so well, but at least, you know, you're forced into some change happening. You have a child, all of a sudden you're forced to mature in some way. And so many of us can look back and we can see in our life that we have matured, but if we're honest, it's not because of some huge kingdom transformation that happened in us, but it was more of a life transition that forced us to grow with that transition. But what I want you to catch, and I've said this over and over again, and I say it to myself all the time, any Sean is possible. And I can say it this way, any you is possible in Jesus Christ. That your growth chart in God, yeah, it should be faithful, 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 but then there ought to be a spike where there was a kingdom transformation, where God broke through, where something really amazing happens where you become new, a newer version of the new you, right? So then we get to chapter 23. Paul is brought before the, another group of people. Again, Groundhog Day for Paul. This time he's standing in front of a spiritual supreme court of sorts. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there. Paul notices that there are Pharisees and Sadducees. And so he says this. He says, guys, the reason I'm here is because of the hope of the resurrection. Now, that was not only a true statement, but that was also Paul walking in wisdom because he knew that the Pharisees believed in resurrection and the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. And so he wanted to state why he was there. And we learned that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the, the cornerstone of our faith, the keystone of our faith, and the capstone of our faith. So much so that if you take the resurrection out of the picture, the whole arch crumbles, right? Paul says that if, if you take the resurrection out, that we are to be most pitied without the resurrection. And the, so Paul stands up again. 
We go into chapter 24. Paul is before Felix, and here we go again. He's in the same situation over and over again, and we find out that Felix is a man of many false selves. He has many sides. He presents many masks, and many of us wrestle with this as well. But what we're learning along the way is if we want to go from having a hard heart to experience this resurrection that Paul talked about, we too have to lay down our false selves. You know, Pete Scazzaro talks about it in the way that he tied it in with the temptations of Jesus that we're all tempted with, that I am what I do, I am what I have, and I am what other people think. These are temptations all of us battle, but we have to lay down our false selves and, and to, uh, I mean, you guys know there's only one person to please, right? And if we please God, everything else falls into its right place. Then last week, Pastor Aaron talked about at, at chapter 26, he was standing again before another group of people, this time King Agrippa. And King Agrippa was like, not sure, almost convinced. And so what we have here over and over and over again is Paul facing the same situation over and over and over again. Has anybody ever faced the same wall over and over and over again, the same pressure over and over and over again? Maybe today you're in this place right now and you walked in and you're carrying the same weight that you've been carrying that you're thinking, I should have been past this by now. I should have been beyond this by now. Why do I find myself in the same pressure over and over and over again? Can I just get a show of hands? Has anybody been there? Maybe you are there, because I, I can certainly be counted among that. What do, what do you do when you find yourself in the same pressure? Well, I wanna to talk to you about what happens in that pressure and maybe what's going on as an opportunity in the pressure. So if you're experiencing this pressure, let me put this up on the screen. Pressure can be a gift to reveal areas of my life where I've learned to trust in myself and not in Jesus. See, what happens when the pressure comes is it exposes something that's been going on in us, usually. You realize that the gospel, the whole of the gospel is just one big invitation to trust Jesus, not yourself. Can I get, can I get a better amen out of that? I mean, come on, somebody. I mean, to trust, in, I mean, we're not trusting in our good work, we're trusting in what he has done, right? We're not trusting in how good we are, but how good he is. The whole of the gospel is simply an invitation to trust in Jesus and not in ourselves. And so if we want to mature in God, we call that sanctification. Sa sanctification is, is over time, because how I many you guys know when you get saved, you're not fully there, but over time, being able to surrender every single area of our life to be able to fully trust in Jesus and not ourselves. So one way we could look at maturing in God is being able to fully trust in Jesus, but we have to surrender areas of our life over time. It doesn't always happen all at once. And so what happens is when the pressure comes, all it's doing is it's exposing an area of your life that you haven't fully trusted in Jesus. But it's an opportunity. Because, and here's the thing, in God's love and his mercy at times, God doesn't cause all things, but God will use all things, but in his love and his mercy, he will allow pressure to come into your life to expose an area that you need to trust him in more. So let me just give you a couple examples of, of areas where maybe we get exposed at times. Has anybody ever worried about your finances before, right? It's like, and you find yourself over and over and over again. It's like, you know, it's like when you were, when we were younger, married, you know, we didn't have a lot, but we'd run into times where we, we needed some money or how are we gonna get out of this one? How's God gonna come through? And God came through. Then when we had more, how do you, isn't it weird that when you get more, like you, when you are one place and you think if I get there, then I will be able to trust and be able to relax, but then you get there and there's always a moving target, right? What's going on with that? See, some of us could have infinitely more and we would still worry because it's not about the amount, it's about our source. And so what happens if you find yourself at the same wall over and over and over again and you're worrying about 
money over and over and over again. All that's doing, that pressure is simply exposing an area of God where you've trusted something else as your source rather than God as your source. You've trusted your job as your source, the economy as your source, rather than God as your source. Or maybe you find yourself getting angry over and over and over again with the same person, right? Or the same, maybe it's different things, different people, but you find that same feeling rise up and over, over and over and over again. What's going on there? All that is, is pressure exposing an area where we don't trust God. And so if the goal is maturing in Christ, if the, if the goal of maturing in Christ is full trust, then it can be a gift at times when we experience pressure because it's revealing an opportunity for us to put our full trust in God. And if we don't, what happens? You're naturally gonna take a test over and over and over again. Why? Because it's not that God is being mean in some way, it's that God is giving you another opportunity to put more trust in him. Is anybody getting this today? Okay, I just, you guys are all quiet, so I just don't know sometimes. You know, I have to, I have to guess. But some of us, have you guys ever found yourself taking the test over and over and over again? Yes. So what do we do? What do we do in those times? What's going on in those times? Well, I wanna illustrate it through something God showed me a, a while back, and it, it's kind of, it's literally painful for me, and you'll know why when I tell the story, but it, it's literally painful for me, but it was an example of what happens sometimes when we try to, to outdo the test, so to speak. So let's take a look, let's watch. So years ago, I got really serious about trying to lift weights and not just exercise, but trying to bulk up and put on some muscle. And so I bought these weights and I have a friend of mine who uh, was kind of a personal trainer on the side. He put together a workout program for me and, and I bought these weights that, that kind of had a click feature that can just keep increasing the weights. And so I told him, I said, hey, if I just keep increasing the weight every time I lift, like that's, that's the plan, right? And he's like, yeah. And I don't think he thought I was serious because he may not have known that like I'm really serious about those type of things. And so if I am going to increase the weight, I'm going to increase the weight. And so every time I lifted, sure enough, I just kept increasing the weight, increasing, I can't even do that, increasing the weight over and over again until guess what happened? I got a hernia because I unwisely kept putting on more weight faster than my actual growth could handle. And so I got a hernia, it failed miserably. And a lot of times we feel pressure like that because there's the, the weight is outpacing our growth. And so we feel this strain, we feel this pressure, we feel failure happen because of that, because we're unwisely trying to shortcut our way out of things. And so we end up having to take the test over again. But is that what happened to Paul? Because in in Acts chapter 25, verse 8, it says, Paul argued in his defense, neither against the Jews, the, the law of the Jews, uh, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. I mean, he's standing before here again, at Groundhog Day for Paul, over and over again. Has he failed the test or what's going on? It says, but Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. Paul's saying, I haven't done anything wrong here. I'm, I'm standing here, and it looks like he's having to take a test over and over again. But in Paul's case, maybe something else is going on. Because pressure can also be an opportunity for us to simply practice living by faith. Because Sometimes we just need to get more reps in, not at extra weight, trying to shortcut our way out, but just at a sustained weight of getting more reps in where we practice living the life of faith. And many times if we feel pressure and we try to just shortcut our way out of it to pass a test, in the natural what happens and also in the spiritual is we end up memorizing the answers instead of internalizing the answers. And God wants us to practice a life of living by faith. Sometimes we find ourselves in the same position over and over again because we need to take the test over, but sometimes it's just because we're positioned so that we can continue to get reps, we can continue to practice living a life of faith so that we no longer are outpaced in our, in our strength, but we're able to learn to live in the sustained, sustained strength 
that God gives us and that God brings into our life. How many of you guys have got good at memorizing the answers? See, if pressure then is an opportunity to practice our faith, then what are we to practice? What are some things? Well, let's look at Paul's theme here as he talks in chapter 25, verse 11. He's standing up again in front of people. He says, if then I'm a wrongdoer and I've committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not es- seek to escape death. See, Paul, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not wanting to be a martyr, but he's not running from it either. He says, but if there's nothing to the charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. He's, he's in no hurry to be a martyr, but he's willing to. This is kind of Paul's theme. We go over to, first, or to Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And here's this famous line that you've probably heard before. For to live, for, for, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is Paul's theme. And so practicing living by faith could be, and I just want to share two thoughts based on this, could be just centered right into this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. How do we apply that in this life? The first thing is this, and I'll just put it this way. If you're in the pressure, you need to practice the presence of God. Practice the presence of God. See, that when the pressure is on in your life, There is a difference between wondering where God is and looking for where God is. Let me say that again. When you are in the pressure, there's a difference between wondering where is God and looking for where is God. One is accusatory, one's anticipatory. See, what happens is when we find ourselves standing up over and over again, we're, we're not fully trusting in God, we start to accuse God instead of anticipate God. And you may have been in a long season, I've been there too, where where you don't see God, you wonder where God is, but at some point you have to stop wondering and start looking. This is practicing the presence of God. In the 17th century, there was a guy who eventually became a monk and they call him Brother Lawrence. And I read a book of his writings just a few weeks ago. And he was a guy that became a monk because he just wanted to devote himself to God. And he ended up spending the rest of his life working in the kitchen, doing menial tasks, and then also repairing other people's sandals all day long. But in it, over time, he became famous more after his life than even during it, even though to some degree during his life. But he became famous because of his ability and his practice, what he called practicing the presence of God to be able to realize that God is everywhere and anywhere if you just look for him. And even in the kitchen, as he was doing his chores, he would just be hyper aware of God's presence. He cultivated it. He didn't wonder where God was in the dishes. He started to look for where God was. And he began to see God all over the place. I'll just give you one of his quotes. He said this, he said, you need not cry too loud He is nearer to us than we think. And it certainly doesn't always feel like that, does it? But it is absolutely true. But we have to practice the presence of God, especially in the pressure. In the pressure, we're tempted to lean on our own strength rather than God's strength. In our pressure, we're tempted to accuse God rather than look for God. In our pressure, we tend to think like Old Testament times that God is somewhere out there, but he's not somewhere around here, right? You know, in the Old Testament, what happened, they they would carry the Ark of the Covenant around in the tent of meeting. And as they wandered around in the wilderness, it was called the tent of meeting because God would meet people there, right? And years later, David wanted to build God a big house, he said, and and. You know, eventually Solomon would, but here's what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. God is saying, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. 
He would lead them by a fire by night and a pillar of smoke by day. He would have these encounters on the mountain or maybe in the tent of meeting and only a few people got to be there. Only a few people really saw it happen. And so here, here's the question though, was God really contained in that tent? No, God wasn't contained in that tent. God couldn't be contained in that tent. God, you see, here's the thing about God. God can be in two places at once and in one place at a time and yet everywhere all at the same time. Now, you guys know what I'm saying. It's like he's omnipresent. And so when God says he's in the tent, he is in the tent, but he's also everywhere else. See, God can be watching over all the universe and be present in every prayer that has ever been prayed throughout all of history because God is not bound by time and so God is present throughout all of history and all of future and he can be present in every single prayer guarding over all the universe and yet when I pray, he can be so present and so close with me as it's as if he's only with me and I'm the only one. But you have to practice that awareness of the presence of God because it doesn't always feel like that. And so in all circumstances, we have to cultivate an ongoing awareness of God's nearness. So right now, you may not feel like God is near, but I can assure you, he certainly is. You may wonder where God is, or you can start to look for where God is. And it may take more time than you think, and it may take rearranging your schedule and rearranging the, your perspective to be able to see what God is doing. A couple weeks ago, I shared a, a video clip from Pastor Wayne Cordero, a guy that I, he's really helped me out a lot in a lot of ways, and so I was saving this one for this week, uh, but he explains this so well, so let's take a look. Here's the first of the questions. Ask yourself, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Because whatever you're looking for, if you're looking for love, as the old song says, you're gonna find love in all the wrong places. If you're looking for what's wrong, you're predisposed to see what you're looking for. God just created us that way. There's a reticular activating system in our brain that filters out everything else except what we're looking for. And if you're, if, if you're looking for what's wrong in your marriage, you're gonna see a ton wrong. If you're looking for what's wrong in a church, you're gonna see everything is wrong. I mean, I can look at you and tell you 10 things right now that's wrong with you. A couple of you, way more, but, uh, but you can look at me and see 50 things wrong with me. It just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Isn't that right? And if you come to a church looking for evidences of his absence, you're going to see that God's not here. But if you're looking for evidences of his presence, you're going to see him everywhere. Because Matthew 6, says, the lamp of your body is your eye. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be filled with darkness. And if that light that is in you is darkness, how great shall that darkness be? It's exactly what he's saying. The, the, uh, the Old Testament says it this way in the book of Psalms. Let's read this scripture, Psalm 109 together. Go. He also loved cursing, so it came to him. And he did not delight in blessing, so it was. Yeah, he loved cursing and it followed him. He loved finding what was wrong, so wrong came to him. His marriage is wrong, his thinking is wrong, his eyesight's wrong, his friends are wrong, everything is wrong, decisions are wrong. He did not delight in blessings, and they were far. That's why we want to look for the miraculous of what God's doing here. Look for God's favor. You're going to see him everywhere. We're the people that God has given that ability to, and that's called eyes of faith. We need to look with eyes of faith. But you're going to see what you're looking for. I'm going to give you another test. Are you ready? <laughs> Students, here we go. I'm going to show you a video, and you're pretty good at counting, so I want you to count and be very accurate, all right, because the uh, answers will be different. So let's take a look at this video and be as accurate as you can. Here we go. Look at the video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Here we go. Yeah. 
The answer is 13. How many got it? But watch. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> Just going to rewind the tape. Same tape, believe it or not. Now watch. He's going to come across in a bear suit. There he is. There he goes. How many did not see the moonwalking bear? You see, you're going to see what you're looking for, even if it's a moonwalking obvious bear. You're going to miss it. And you'll say, God is not here. He said, I walked right in front of you. I even moonwalked for you. No, you did not. You were not here at all. That's because the question is, what are you looking for? Look for God. Be hungry for the things of God. What's God saying? What's he doing? How's he moving in my life? Write it down. You will see God everywhere. Even like this word here, read it when it comes up. Here it goes. God, yeah, it can either be God is nowhere or God is now here. Exactly the opposite. It just depends on what you're looking for. So good. So what are you looking for? I know some of you guys have seen that, something like that before, but how many of you guys did not see the moonwalking bear? Did not see? Okay. Some of you guys saw it right off, but it all depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking for the presence of God in your pressure? So that's practicing the presence of God. To live is Christ, practicing awareness of, of God's presence. Second thing, to die is gain. Practice the resurrected life. Well, how do we do that now? <laughs> to die is gain. You, you know, how do we do that? Well, we have on our sign out there, like, to, that on earth as it is in heaven, in this city as it is in heaven. We, we talk about it several times that, that as believers, we, as best we can, we look to the coming kingdom and we set our clocks to the time zone we're going in and we begin to live that now. That's called the life of faith. That's practicing living by faith, the resurrected life. So we start living on the other side of the pressure right now. That's not to ignore what's going on. That's not to try to cheat our way out of a test. That's simply to say, do I have eyes to see what's on the other side? Or am I so caught up in the way things are? Do I have eyes to see people in the love of God and not in their problems right now? Do I have eyes to see on the other side of this pressure? Do I have eyes to see on the other side of this pain? Do I have eyes to see? Can I practice the presence of God? Are we paralyzed in our pressure or are we readying for a resurrection? Are we paralyzed in our pressure or are we readying our heart for a resurrection? Because a resurrection is coming. So I want to close out by telling a, a story that illustrates this that I read about during my sabbatical. I've read it several times, and maybe you have too, but just to set the stage, it's in the Old Testament, and Samuel the prophet is being told that he's going to anoint the first king of Israel. He doesn't know who it is, though, and so uh, he, he's, he's ready, and he's open before God to, to anoint this king. Well, meanwhile, this guy named Saul is walking around looking for some lost donkeys that, that got lost. And they'd been wandering around for days. They can't find him. And so finally somebody suggests that, well, there's a prophet in the area. Maybe we can go to him and he'll tell us where they are. And so they wanted to go to the prophet. First Samuel chapter nine, verse 14. So they went up to the city. And as they were entering the city, they saw Samuel, the prophet, coming towards them on his way up to the high place. Now, the day before Saul came, this is very important. The day before Saul came, the Lord revealed to Samuel Tomorrow, about this time, I'm going to send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. And he shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because of their cry has come to me. The day before, Saul, or God gives Samuel this word, tomorrow, at this time, there's going to be a guy. You don't know who it is, but he's going to be the guy to anoint him. And so what could Samuel do? Samuel could have just sat there all day waiting for the guy. As we'll see, that's not what he did. It says, when Samuel saw Saul, that's a tongue twister right there. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, 
here's the man of whom I spoke to you. He's the one that should restrain my people. And we go down to verse 22. Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought him into the hall and gave them a place at a head of, as the head of those who had been invited who were about 30 persons. What? What's going on here? See, Samuel acted on the word of the Lord that he was going to anoint a guy that next day at that time. So what did he do? In the meantime, he readied. He began to, he invited 30 noble people. He set up a whole banquet. He reserved a, an empty chair for the head seat of the guy he was going to anoint. He was not just sitting around, but he was readying. And it says, and Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you, of which I said, put it aside. He had already thought to put aside a special portion and have the cook. He told the cook in advance, hey, there's, there's gonna be a guy. And think about the risk of Samuel, of his humiliation if nobody ever showed up. He invited all these noble people. His reputation's on the line. He's a prophet, after all. And if he gets it wrong, he had nothing to go on except for a word from God. And he goes to all of this, he sets all of this up, he sets it all aside, and he said, so the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, see, what was kept is now set before you. Eat because it was kept for you until the appointed hour or until the hour appointed that you may eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. Saul would not have ate with Samuel that day had Samuel been paralyzed by the pressure. Samuel was practicing a life of faith. He acted on the word of God when all he had was the word of God. But he, at the expense, at the potential of him being embarrassed or looking foolish or wasting time or wasting money, invited all these people, set up a whole thing, had an empty chair, a part set aside for, for someone to eat on the word from God. See, we want God to transform us but God, and God will transform us, but God wants us to be a part of helping to set the table. Because God is coming, and he's gonna come into our life, and he gives us the word, and he wants to transform us, but in the meantime, he wants us to start setting the table to be ready for his coming. That's called faith. The most logical thing for Samuel to do, if he believed God, was to set the table. The most illogical thing for him to do, if, I mean, if he didn't believe God, then he shouldn't have set the table. But because he believed God, it made total sense for him to set the table because he knew that God was coming. And so we set the table in order to simply receive what God is going to do. We're not doing what God is going to do, but we're invited to set the table for what God is going to do in our life and in the world around us. We should be anticipating that. I've told you guys this before, but when Becca and I go on, on dates, you know, we'll, we'll go up to the, to the table where we'll order our food and, and we're waiting. We've got our glass of water. We've got our silverware up there and then we're waiting. And how many of you guys know, you, you don't know when the food is coming, right? You just don't know. You're just waiting. It's sometime, you know, it's near, but you don't know. And so there's a lot of times when, you know, we'll be sitting there talking and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, I'll start moving stuff around and everything like that. Becca's starting moving stuff around. Nobody's coming, but I'm just tricking her and she gets mad at me because she's getting all ready for the food. It's great. Try it sometime. It works. It works. But the, the point is the most logical thing for us to do when we've ordered some food is to move things around and rearrange the table because it's coming if we believe it's coming, Right. See, God wants us to be a part of helping to set the table, and we do that by faith. And so I wanna encourage you as the worship team comes back up to think of just one area of your life where you may be struggling in the pressure right now. Practice looking for God, not wondering where God is. Practice the resurrected life what is it that God would have you start rearranging the table and setting the table for? See, when God is going to transform us or do something new in us or bring us out of the pressure or bring us into a new day, it's not that we just sit and wait. We prepare for a resurrection. That's living the life of faith. You know what that might include? That it might include getting some things right in our heart. That it might include getting some things right in our bank account to be prepared to step out and buy faith. 
It might include uh, positioning ourselves in a place around people who are going to help us grow. It might include getting the word, more of the word of God on the inside of us so that we can be ready for the word of God to come through us and out of us, whatever it is. But it makes total sense if you think the food is coming to start moving the place, pieces around and getting ready for it, to start setting the table. So imagine living on the other side of the pressure. That's not to discount our feel. I'm not saying don't deal with your current stuff. Deal with it. Experience it. Do whatever you gotta do there. But at the same time, can you see through the eye of faith on the other side? Can you see it? Can you see the relationship healed? Can you see things made whole? Can you see joy again? I think we have permission from the Holy Spirit to get our hopes up. I think we have permission from the Holy Spirit to start to some degree living in the joy of the other side now. That's not to say we don't deal with the pain. We do. It's not to say we ignore our feelings. We, we look at those as indicator lights. Like, what, God, what are you saying? How, what do I need to work on here? But at the same time, this is the tension, at the same time, we have permission to practice the presence of God, to practice the resurrected life, to say, what does it look like on the other side? We have, the, we have permission from the Holy Spirit to, from time to time, lift up our eyes and to see what God is doing, to live by faith now. I'm gonna close out by reading. I just felt like I was supposed to read this. Somebody is gonna receive something out of this. This is something that I read in a book years and years ago, a book called uh, The Lion Chaser, I believe, by Mark Batterson. And he just calls this the Lion Chaser's Manifesto for some reason, and I just, I just, I just like it. So I'm gonna read it to you. It says, quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Keep asking questions, keep making mistakes, keep seeking God. Stop pointing out problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Stop playing it safe and start taking risks. Expand your horizons, accumulate experiences, enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can. Somebody needs to hear that today. Live like today is the first day and the last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges, blaze new trails, criticize by creating, worry less about what people think and more about what God thinks, amen. Don't try to be who you're not, be yourself, laugh at yourself, don't let fear dictate your decisions, take a flying leap of faith. And there's something in that, that when I read that, it just makes me want to live the resurrected life now a little bit more. Just makes me want to expand out and say, I am not, just like that word, I'm not in some sort of steel cage. But any Sean is possible. Anything is possible with God. I'm not captivated and a captive to this pressure, to this situation, or to this Groundhog Day. But one day, on the other side, there's a new world out there, and I, st I better start readying my insides for the outside. I better start doing some things, some preparation. I better start setting the table because I got a word from God that something's new. And I may not see it for two years, five years, but I better start readying and setting the table now so that I can cooperate with what God is going to do then. So that it's possible for that sentence Saul ate with Samuel. There are some appointments that you need to have that God wants to set up that are only possible if a Samuel starts readying the table. And so in your pressure, would you guys stand up with me? Here's the good news that God is with us even in the pressure. 
And the pressure can just be a gift to reveal areas where we haven't fully surrendered our life to God. And so God, for me, I just say, I want all in. So if I feel the pressure, Lord, reveal these areas where I haven't surrendered, where I haven't fully trusted you. God, would you reveal to us areas of our life where we can start right now setting the table. We can start right now practicing the life of faith. Lord, I pray for a Holy Spirit encouragement and boldness to, to stop wondering where God is and start looking for where God is. For a Holy Spirit boldness to move out of being paralyzed and start to be mobilized by faith. So Lord, we, we make that our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him.